Hi everyone, I'm Gary Knoll. I'd like to welcome you to another Classroom on the Air. Today, how to stop and reverse hair loss, whether it's male pattern or female pattern baldness, thinning, graying prematurely. These are major problems for a lot of us. And because we were told, well, it's genetic and you really can't do anything about it, most people would just say, okay, I'll just accept it. And they'll do that comb over or they'll get a wig uh, or they'll just accept, okay, I'm okay. I, I'd like to have full head of hair, but I don't have it. In my own family, every male is bald. Now, when you add in my mother's side and my father's side, plus my brothers, my father, and myself, that's, that's a lot of guys. And it was that way early on. Now, I've been a vegan or vegetarian most of my life. Don't drink, don't smoke, didn't do drugs, and uh, not been overweight and lived as healthy a life as I can. And yet it didn't change my hair thinning and a big receding hairline. And in fact, I used to let my hair grow longer just so that it didn't look uh, as if I was losing my hair. But I was losing my hair in my early 20s. And that stopped and totally reversed by something that was rather serendipitous, something I hadn't planned for. And I'll, I'll get into that later. But then I wanted to see if it was just a fluke. And it wasn't. I had friends who were bald, thinning, or graying prematurely. They tried a protocol, and it worked. And I had all my friends who were medical doctors and scientists and nurses. We had a lot of people. It took hours. But first night, there was, no, there was just getting people into the study itself. But most people had dyed their hair or didn't, didn't show that they were that bald or that thin so that they didn't get in. So we had 1,500 people in the study. And then we worked for a year. We met once a month and for about three hours. And uh, in fact, it was such a large group, we had to meet in uh, three times in a night so everybody could fit in the high school auditorium we were using. And it was a healthy diet and uh, with extra nutrients like silica and magnesium, calcium, vitamin D3, vitamin K, uh, folic acid, B12, things that we knew be complex. If you were deficient, if you had too much vitamin A, you could lose your hair. If you had too little, if you had too much vitamin D, you could lose your hair. Too little, you could lose your hair. So it was finely tuned. And at the end of that year, lo and behold, we did not have a statistically significant number of people who either stopped thinning, reversed balding, or reversed premature gray. In fact, I thought, wow, you know, I don't see a whole lot of healthy people at the end of this study. They should have been healthy because it was exercising and stress management. Three months after that, I was walking down Broadway, right at 83rd where my office was, and a person stopped me on the street. And it was a short guy, and he had a beret on. He said, Gary, I see that. He says, do you remember me? I was in your hair study. I said, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm uh, I was up on stage and everybody else was in the auditorium. I, I didn't focus on individuals. He said, well, take a look. And he takes off his beret and he's got hair growing. Okay. It's small, but it's there. And he said, and I said, and what am I supposed to be looking at? He said, I was bald. I was in your study for a year. Nothing happened. I said, well, what's happening now? It's three months ago. He said, well, I got to be honest with you. I was there just to socialize. You know, I'm a short guy. I was bald headed and I'm young. And uh, it's not easy for me and a lot of other guys to meet women. And so I did it as to socialize because afterwards, a whole bunch of us went to a Chinese restaurant. We filled the whole restaurant and all the people from your study all eating the wrong stuff. So I said, so you and other people didn't follow the protocol. He says, no. No, we didn't follow the protocol. It was wonderful, you know, the whole energy, the atmosphere. Uh, and I said, wow. So I went up to my office and I asked the staff, contact everyone who was in the study and just ask them a question. Did you follow the protocol? And if so, to what degree or not? And the responses we got were most people did not follow the protocol. However, the 5% who did improve followed the protocol. So I said, it's not the protocol that was wrong. 
It was the adherence to it. So we got to get people who are willing to stick with it. And how can we do that? So I created a new go around, but this time they had to prove before they could get in each month that they had done their homework. They had to have shot journals and we had to see a difference in them on a monthly basis. For example, we would do an impedance. So if they had the same percentage of body fat, same uh, percentage of muscle and weren't improving, then they were out of the study. They, you know, you can't come in. Well, boy, that got after first time and about one third of people were not allowed in the study anymore. Then everyone else was in the study said, yeah, I can't cheat this time. I got to do it. The results were now we had 90% improvement at the end of a year, 90%. And the oldest person in the study also had been completely bald. He was in his 80s. He had all this new natural brown hair. And women whose eyebrows had thinned out because of menopause and postmenopause, their eyebrows thickened out, their hair came back. And you could see because we couldn't allow anyone to study who dyed their hair because we were taking photographs and measuring their actual hair and uh, taking pictures of their head and skin. Their skin improved, their nails improved because your nails should be pink, hard, and smooth, not cracked and rigid and fungus on the fingernails and toenails. And so we took pictures of everyone's hands, feet, face, and then the impedance. So not only to get their hair back, but they also lost weight, gained muscle, de-stressed, and had really nice skin. So what was good for the uh, what was good for the hair was also good for the skin. And then I was in 1989. I was down in Texas, the Healing Springs Ranch, and I had to go from there to a national tour. And these are really rough because where I was going on tour, Cheyenne, uh, Cheyenne Wyoming, uh, and a lot of towns, they don't have a vegan restaurant. You know, these are meat and potato, you know, an iceberg salad, you know, coffee and a piece of cheesecake. That's what they eat for like a dinner. So I had to go to some stores to get cans of beans and uh, buy potatoes and rice, brown rice. And literally, I had to take it into a kitchen in a restaurant and say, what's your most expensive meal? What's $20? Okay, I'll give you $20. You don't have to use any of your food. Would you make these dishes for me? And they did. There, there was no exception. After all, they were making 20 bucks with no expense in materials. But something else happened. I had a five-acre garden, organic garden. And I had dozens of vegetables growing. And I also had some blueberries, raspberries, strawberries growing. And I'm thinking, I'm going to be gone while this stuff should be harvested. So a friend of mine um, named Dave was there, and he's very inventive. And I said, so I'll just give all this stuff to the local community and come in and harvest stuff. He said, well, you can also juice it, and I can dry it without heat. I said, really? He said, yeah. I said, okay, let's do it. So we juiced everything, and then that took two days. And then he dried it without heat. Well, remember, juice is about 97% water. So you're taking the water out of a fruit or vegetable, and you have very little matter left. And uh, you're also taking out the fiber. So the really the most powerful part of any vegetable is the micronutrients, the phytonutrients, that are left inside of what was the plant, which becomes the juice minus the fiber. And you need fiber, by the way. This was only something to supplement what I was eating. And I looked and there were only like six gallons of this. I said, that's it from that whole, yeah, yeah. He says, this is really concentrated. It's okay, fine. I didn't even know what it was. I, did, I, didn't, I didn't go out there and see where this is spinach, this is kale. It was just a bunch of greens. And every day I started taking it mainly for energy because I knew there was a lot of chlorophyll in there. And it was a living food, so I knew it was really boosting my mitochondria. Because when you're on tour, when I'm on tour, it's draining because I had a lot of media coverage. I remember going into Toronto in a day and a half. I did 22 different appearances, interviews, 
overnight shows, long shows, short morning shows, interviews. And so you're exhausted. So I couldn't go to a restaurant. Sometimes there was no time on the tour even to go to a restaurant. In fact, I would, I would get what little sleep I had, whether it was on a bus going to another community or an airplane. Because when I got there and the person met me, they said, okay, here's your schedule. And I would ask my publisher in New York, could you have them just, if there's a health food store, buy these items for me, like some walnut butter, et cetera and some sunflower seeds and pumpkin seeds. So I was snacking on all this stuff because I didn't have time, literally didn't have time in more than 35 days being on the road of sitting down and having a quality meal. Okay. But I had energy. So when about, about a month after I got back, I'm in the laboratory and I'm sitting there working on a project and I just put my finger up to my head to scratch my head and I suddenly I felt something. And then I felt, and I felt all over. And where I was going way back and receding, I had little tiny follicles. So I went in to the bathroom, looked in the mirror, pulled my hair back, and there were all these new hair growths where I had been completely smooth skin, way receding. I thought, well, what's this from? You know, I haven't done anything different. But I had. I just wasn't aware of it. It took me several months to figure out what happened. And I would later call this the laws of compensation. But you have to understand it. To the degree that you have any imbalance in your body or your mind, you have to exceed the energy level. This is where people kind of sometimes don't fully appreciate what I'm saying. You have to exceed not just the molecular, you have to exceed the energy, because everything in your body is energized. Every cell has energy. Take away the energy and you're dead. The only thing that's missing when you're dead is your energy, right? The one thing we seem not to be interested in studying. And I spent my whole adult career studying life energy and the exchange of energy. Uh, for example, being around people are laughing. It's great for your immune system, but you're in harmony about something you find funny. And that's good for your immunity, it's good for bonding. And we learn more through humor than we do from just being serious. And it's everything we do is an exchange of energy. Like right now, you've given up time. You've, you've an ex exchanged the time you could be doing something else, working on your computer, reading, exercising, and you're watching this uh, video, all right? So I have to present something that is not only informative, but hopefully explains the energy that's going to make the difference. Because unless you change the energy, you're not going to change the gene expression. But we also know that genes can express themselves differently based upon energy input, the emotion in the energy. Remember, if I'm sitting here, there's no noise in this room. But I bring a radio in, a shortwave radio. Again, there's no noise. I turn it on. And there's electrical pulses coming. And I turn the channel, and suddenly I'm listening to something in Chinese, Japanese, Swedish, speak, music, talk. Where'd that come from? It's coming constantly, these electrical impulses. And they're, they're vibrating at different levels, different frequencies. But the message is inside that, and your receiver decodes it. If you didn't decode it, it would just be static. But if you can decode it, then you can get the message. But you couldn't see that message. You couldn't hear that message. And that's the energy. How often have you looked in someone's eyes and you suddenly said, wow, All right? It's just an eyeball, a retina, you know, macula. No, there's energy coming through the eyes. You know when, if you're a parent, you know when something's wrong. What's wrong? Nothing. No, something's wrong. What's wrong? Nothing's wrong. Then you find out, yeah, there was something wrong. That intuition is an energy that is able to read something and know it because intuition is pure. In any case, your energy is telling you 
it's reading a situation and it's reading other energy and it's telling you something's wrong here. And that's all it can do. It can tell you something's wrong. And then later you find out, we ever lied to? I don't think so. Ever cheated on no. Well, wait, I felt I was, but I didn't follow it up. And it turns out it was true. So your intuition is going to tell you something, whether you want to know it or not, whether you have the courage to follow it through or not. A mother knows their baby because they're bonded. They're sharing the same maternal energy. When the baby is in the womb, the mother's singing, the mother massaging the belly, something women do all over the world from all cultures who didn't know that anyone else was doing it because it's creating an energy, a bond that you are wanted, you're loved. I'm here for you. And the baby is living through that. And synchronizing heartbeats can also occur. We also know when we're, we're stressed out and suddenly a cat or a bird or a dog sits with us. It knows intuitively that we need it. We need to pet that dog. We need to hold hands with a loved person. We need a hug. Remember, what was about three years ago, people were uh, opening businesses to do hugging, where you go and just hug for five or ten minutes. Yeah, and it worked. Why? Because dopamine hits. Now you can get dopamine hits by taking drugs. That's not good. And sugar, that's not good. Caffeine, that's not good. But a dopamine hit also means you're releasing a natural hormone, a feel-good hormone. Now there's oxycontin, bad, but it relieved people's pain. And oxytocin, good, the love hormone. So when you're petting your pet after about 10 minutes, that dog or your pet or you are all experiencing that sense of calm. I'm giving you this as background just to let you know that every day, everything you do is trying to read the environment you're in to see if you have to give something up to get something. And is it causing a balance, rebalancing or an imbalancing? And a lot of our life, once we get it to a certain age, everything is out of balance. Oh, I've got diabetes. Oh, I got high blood pressure. Oh, I have cancer. Oh, I have, and now you're out of balance. And that's going to affect you at the emotional level, the life level, and the physical level. So in order to reverse that, you have to exceed the energy, exceeding the energy of disease. You have to exceed energy of healing. I won't go into that anymore. That's a separate lecture that takes about six hours. I do that at our health retreats because we're, we're not rushed and people want to know this because it takes them to a deeper level of understanding how to deal with crisis in their life, how to deal with disease, and how to be happier by knowing what energy you should allow into your life, and what energy you should let go of in your life. But in any case, in, when you're eating food that is pure and loaded with nutrition, then suddenly we have what we call, and you've heard it, right? Superfoods, goji berries, noni juice, superfoods. Now we have wild blueberries, a superfood. Spirulina, chlorella, uh, chlorophyll, superfoods, nutrients that can help slow down the aging process, like NAD+, vitamin D3, and PQQ, L-carnosine, and vitamin E and tocotrienols, and resveratrol, and pycnogenol. Now, when we have these in balance, not too much and not too little, suddenly we have exceeded the limitation that occurs or deficiency, we don't have enough. As a result, we're imbalanced. And you get imbalanced because of what I call the laws of compensation. We have to understand that when something is wrong in our life, whatever it is, we're running out of money, we have too much debt, our relationship no longer has that spark, that flame, that passion, that joy, that excitement it once had. Sometimes we have someone unique in our life and we no longer appreciate their uniqueness. Imagine how that feels. And that's why we have to stay humble and we have to place emphasis on what's most important, improving the quality of all of our parts of our life, spiritually, physically, intellectually, creatively, biochemically. And when all those are in balance, we are harmonized and we're going to live like Fred Astaire danced smoothly, 
even when we hit bumps, even when we hit crisis, we'll be able to understand this is okay. I may not like it, doesn't feel good, doesn't sound good, but I'm on my way out of this storm into a rainbow. So you have to keep going forward and your spirit will allow that to happen, your intuition. The uniqueness of yourself, energy, will allow that. So understand it's not just people that have it. Why, why do you think some people have the it factor? Exciting to look at. You know, people swoon over them because they have the it. Terry Grant had the it, all right? And Clark Gable had the it. Myrna Loy had it. And uh, Ginger Rogers had it. Catherine Hepburn had it. So not everyone has it. That doesn't mean that they're less talented. It just means that there's a dynamic energy that some people have that expresses itself in a way that draws us to them. So, when I started working on determining which foods, which beverages, in what form are going to be most powerful in rebalancing and exceeding the genetic expression. That's the key. Compensate. Baldness is here. Cancer is here. Heart disease is there. Obesity is there. I have to exceed all those in energy. And where do I get the energy? Prayer, meditation. Yes. Exercise. Yes. Tai Chi. Acupuncture. Yes. Juicing, absolutely, that suddenly is a big, big energy enhancement. Because you can't eat six apples, but you can juice six apples into a 16-ounce glass of juice. And you're not going to eat a half a bushel of parsley, but if you juiced a half a bushel of parsley, you'd end up with a tiny amount of juice. So what if you took the juices throughout the day, enzymes, live enzymes, the enzymes are like spark plugs in your body. So now you're energizing your cells. You're enhancing your DNA. You're repairing cells, not just allowing them to become damaged and die. You're tightening up the telomeres, which are the proteins that are the ends of your chromosomes. They're like a, a shoestring with that little plastic band on the end that keeps the shoestring from fraying. Well, that's what happens to your cells. The more exercise you do, within reason, so not overdoing it. The more oxygen you're breathing in, the cleaner the air that you're breathing, the more that you are eating what you need, not what you want, the more nutrients you're bringing into your system you were deficient in, now you're tightening up, and that means that you're overcoming deficiencies. Nutritional deficiencies are a big deal, but also emotional deficiencies. Sometimes we're conditioned to believe there's a scarcity of everything. Gary, that's a good idea, but hey, I don't have the money or I don't have the support system or I don't have anyone in my life you know, that I can share anything with. Loneliness is a big, big problem. It's epidemic in our society. Remember when you were growing up, if you were a baby boomer, do you remember your mom or your grandmother or grandfather? Do you remember that the older they got, the more calm they seem to be. They seem to have felt that they were living a life of authenticity. They've been responsible for everything that they were required to and beyond that. We never had school teachers retire in West Virginia. They didn't have to. So we had teachers that taught my mother, my older brother, and myself. You know, generational. They've been around forever. And they were always a pleasant surprise because they were always more understanding. They could always help us with problems we had. And in my hometown, I literally could go one block over to where Mrs. Fredericks was. And uh, I could sit on a swing on her porch with her and talk about some issues, whatever they were. And she just, she'd give me insights I was not smart enough to have. So that was one of the benefits of respecting elders. So there wasn't a moment in her life where she felt unwanted or irrelevant. She was always relevant. All seniors were. I remember when I was 17, uh, Jim Dawson, my buddy and I, 
um, we wanted to know about the history of our town, Parkersburg. And uh, so we went to uh, the library. There was nothing written on Parkersburg. So I went to several older people and I said, if I want to know about the history of this town, where can I find the information? And they said, go to your churches and ask for the oldest congregants and speak with them. But that time, we had people in their 90s, even late 90s, not many, but we had them in my hometown or in the surrounding area. And they were just the nicest people. And they all had photo albums from way back. And one woman that we interviewed who was almost 98 years of age, uh, she was born and uh, with parents from the Civil War. She had all these photographs and talked about what it was like growing up post-Civil War in that area, Wood County. Wow. And they all knew someone else and everyone had a different story. But it became my first book, Parkersburg, an early portrait. And the photographs, no one had seen these before. And we didn't have a regular publisher. You know, uh, one of our friends published it. And, uh, but it was a good history. It was an accurate history. It was their voices. And I didn't meet a single person that didn't say their days weren't full. Their days were full. They never stopped doing things. Oh, I've got, you know, I've got to do this making a quilt or I'm canning something. They were always relevant. And hence they were not. Of course, they said they missed their loved ones who had passed, especially even children who had passed before them and spouses who had passed. But they still had a network of friends. No one was abandoned. And no one was living in poverty. Now compare that to today where tens of millions of senior citizens are living at just a bare minimum. Many go to bed hungry and are lonely and we're doing nothing to help them. So imagine that defi de deficit in your life. So when I say you must rebalance every area of your life because then you're compensating for any deficiency which could cause a lack of balance. And especially if it's, if it's genetic. Remember, the negative messages people inherit when they're children are called epigenetic messages. And suddenly, as an adult, you're doing something or acting a certain way or temperaments a certain way, not realizing that's all coming from when you were a child. But what happened then and how you absorb, absorbed it into yourself and today, totally different. But in your world, it's one and the same. Now, what's this has to do with hair or skin? It has everything to do because with hair, it's genetic in most cases. It can be deficiencies also and can cause this. It can be shock, surgery, trauma, chemotherapy. So what I, what I say, whatever the cause of the imbalance, you must succeed the energy in order to create a newer energy, a healing energy. And that then collapses the previous energy. And that's why, because you must, let's say a woman tests and she has what is perceived to be the gene that will express itself as breast cancer, uterine cancer. Therefore, they take completely healthy breasts. By the thousands and thousands, they've removed healthy young women's breasts because they have the gene. And they say, well, there's nothing to be done to change that. They're all wrong on that. We've proven that. And so we need a different type of science, one that understands real cause and effect. They're looking at symptoms and that's it. I'm looking at causes and I've done the science. I've done the studies. They haven't. We've got the results and we have the videos showing it. So if you understand, if you're eating a bad diet on top of a genetic expression of female or male baldness, you're not going to change it. You've got to change the diet to not just a healthy diet, but a diet that is potentized to a level with the juices and supplements and the foods to where it exceeds genetic expression. Attitude the same way. I can give you the best protocols in the world for any condition, but if you don't have the mindset to follow them, want to become as good as you can, it's not going to work. So what I found was that 
bringing as many phytonutrients from all those vegetables into your body you would normally not eat. I'm not, I'm not going to sit down and eat a bushel basket of salad, but in effect, I was eating a bushel basket of salad in my the powder that I was taking every day. Because when you eliminate the water and then you eliminate the fiber, what you're left with is what is makes up 98% of the healing power of a food. I'm not suggesting people go out and start buying powders. That's not what I'm suggesting. I'm suggesting that in my case, how this all started was realizing we weren't having enough fruits and vegetables into our diet each day. We didn't have enough chlorophyll, the great detoxifier that takes heavy metals out. We weren't having enough vitamin C, enough B-complex, didn't have enough vitamin D3. We weren't happy enough. We weren't motivated enough. And so each area had to be mastered. Remember, no two energies can share the same space with equal intensity at the same time. One will always dominate. So let's just say your anger, your disappointment, your depression, your angst, your jealousy, your envy dominate. Everything else collapses under it. And that's why negative energy produces only a negative outcome. Sooner or later, that manifests as a disease or some other experience. But the opposite is true. When you're doing positive things, thinking positive thoughts, when you're helping other people that you don't have to, but you choose to because it's the right thing to do, when you care about other people, irrespective of their race, religion, age, ethnicity, income, social status, none of that is important. You're simply dealing with another human being as a sacred soul. Then where's the racism? There won't be prejudice. There won't be bigotry. There won't be massaging, there won't be because you're coming from a spiritual place and therefore the energy is healing and it's compensating for what a person has lost. How do you think a person feels when they're going through a rough time and you give them a hug? Right? The hug doesn't change the problem. But the hug is like a mother when you came back and she's, what's wrong? Oh, I, you know, cut my knee, fell. And mother would hold the hug or give it a kiss. And suddenly the boo-boo went away. But suddenly the kid's okay. Well, just a second ago, the kid was crying or you know, in pain. That touch, the energy of exchange, empathy, powerful energy. So your hair is going to have a much better chance to grow back if in every area of your life you've rebalanced it so that there's no negative, there's no deficiency of love, of kindness, of nutrition, of exercise, of meditation, of prayer. You have it all there. And that is how it works. Now, that's from my own personal and clinical experience. And I published this information and did a documentary on it. So let's now look at the medical side of this. If you've been around for more than a few decades, or in some cases even less, you're likely to have had some disappointing experiences related to your hair. It might have become thin. It's my breaking off at the ends. It's not as lustrous uh, and full of body as it once was. It's not just men who experience bald spots, patchiness, and growth or receding hairline. In addition to loss or degradation of the hair on the head, the eyebrows or facial hair may also thin and become finer and withered. And of course, while some people embrace their moon hair, others would rather return to the hair of their youth. Taken all together, problems of the hair can be a source of considerable unhappiness for those affected. The devitalization of hair in one way or another is an extreme common experience. And it's difficult to find remedies which promise real and lasting results. Now, the first part of this discussion, I'm gonna cover the problem of hair loss as a health condition, because that's also part of it, and the research on natural therapies to combat it. And the latter portion of my talk will detail the story, as I just said, of my own serendipitous discoveries that led to the reversal of my own hair loss. As you can see for yourself, 
And I just had, before my last uh, retreat, three months ago, I had, I went to the barber and I said, cut three inches of my hair. My hair was on my shoulders. So you might not have saw that because I slick it all back. But if I were not to slick it back, when I get out of the shower, my hair would be all over the place. But as you can see, it's lusterful, thick, long, <clears throat> and very healthy. And uh, so I'm going to share with you now in kind of a summary way uh, what to do to help yourself and see if your skin and your energy also don't uh, change as well. Hair loss does not arise from a single cause in most cases. It can be a sign of symptoms of a variety of problems, and we have to pay attention to those as well. That's why I like people to be tested on a regular basis, not take their health for granted. It can be a traumatic event, a surgery, or a new medication, or a vaccination. Sometimes it's a general de degradation of your health. Obesity can cause it. Sometimes it's exposure to chemical or other toxins or electromagnetic fields. Sometimes it's a hormonal imbalance, menopause or nutrient deficiencies. And sometimes it's a problem of the immune system. And sometimes it's a combination of multiple factors. A case report was published in 2023, this year, of a Japanese woman in apparently normal health without a past medical or family history who lost all of her hair on her body one week after her first dose of the RNA COVID vaccine. Another case report was made in 2022. A 2005 case-controlled epidemiological study found that people vaccinated with hepatitis B vaccine were significantly more likely to develop an autoimmune condition, including alopecia, hair loss. A case report of alopecia followed vaccination with tetanus toxoid has also been published. A case of hair loss associated with uh, what is called the atrovastin was reported in 20, uh, or 202. And a case report has been published of hair loss associated with psychotropic drugs, such as the tricyclic antidepressants, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, the SSRIs, and the paroxetine. Tumor necrosis factor used to treat Crohn's disease and psoriasis has also been found to induce alopecia as a side effect, as well as induced uh, uh, lesions of the, the type of lesions most people have because of poor skin conditions. The therapeutic approach to each of these hair loss should start with an analysis of the possible cause and cofactors unique to your case. Now, most of us have somewhere in the neighborhood of 100,000 to 120,000 hairs on our head, and you're going to lose a certain percentage, like 50 of them average, or even up to 100 per day. That's normal. And, uh, and But you don't want to lose hair. And sometimes people going through menopause suddenly say, Gary, including a close friend, I'm losing a patch of hair every day. And they start to freak out, understandably so. So we have to understand that your hair goes through life cycles of its own, which has been observed to have three distinct phases. The antigen phase, which is the growth cycle, the catagen, which is the transition phase, and the telogen resting phase. Now, the antigen, that's A-N-A-G-E-N phase, last about three years on average, or from one to seven years, as the case may be. And the most hairs on your body are in this phase at any given time. The longer the antigen period, the longer the hair on the head. The catagen, C-A-T-A-G-E-N phase, lasts about two to four weeks and represents the transition of the hair from being in growth mode to being in resting mode. Yes, your hair grows, it rests, it recycles and becoming what's called a club hair, or one which has been fully formed and is no longer being fed by the body to grow, and therefore it has been left to rest. The final resting, uh, or telogen, T-E-L-O-G-E-N phase, lasts two to four months before the hair is shed, and new hair in the growth phase takes its place. The two to four month length of the telogen phase explains why sometimes a stressful event can occur in your life, emotional event, but you don't experience significant hair fall until several months later. The stress or shock may cause many hairs to abort their growth phase prematurely, 
thus entering the resting phase, but you won't find them actually fall out until a couple of months after the shock. The technical medical term for hair loss or balding is alopecia, A-L-O-P-E-C-I-A. Hair loss has been categorized into two main types, scarring uh, alopecias or non-scarring alopecias. Non-scarring forms of hair loss do not damage the hair follicle itself, while scarring types of hair loss do. Non-scarring alopecias are the most common and have been further differentiated into multiple types. Now, I'm not going to go through all these non-scarring hair types because there's just so many of them, and I don't think it's really what is necessary to know at this time. But just understand, in men, the type of hair loss has been associated with other health conditions. If you have coronary heart disease, prostate enlargement, prostate cancer, diabetes, obesity, high blood pressure, heart attacks, uh, or death from diabetes or heart attacks, abnormal lipids, and infertility, all can cause hair loss. In women, it's associated with polycystic ovarian symptom. Androgenic alopecia is thought to be caused by action of uh, DHT on hair follicles, which is a di hydrotestosterone, uh, which leads to uh, the miniaturization of the hair follicles. In other words, they become smaller. And uh, again, there's things like alopecia areta, uh, tends to begin suddenly and looks like patchy bald spots, little like islands of scalp surrounded by hair, or in more severe cases, little islands of hair surrounded by bare scalp. But there's a numerous of these types. And I've given you the primary reason for them, either hormonal uh, or genetic or causal factors from trauma, surgery, etc. So that's the medical issue of it. So what is the treatment? Well, there are two medications that FDA has approved to treat androgenic alopecia. One is called minoxidil, M-I-N-O X. I-D-I-L, or Rogaine, R-O-G-A-I-N-E, which expands the blood vessel in order to lengthen the growth phase of the hair and increase the size of the hair follicles. And, uh, and you also have what is called Finasteride, F-I-N-A-S-T-E-R-I-D-E, which prevents the conversion of testosterone to dehydrotestosterone, or DHT, and these medications have to be taken on an ongoing basis to offer continuous benefits. They don't always work, and there are side effects. But other conventional treatment options, including hair transplants, and that's one of the safest things to do. I've seen so many of my friends, including my own brother, who had hair transplants. And they take a strip of hair, they surgically numb the back of the head, and they make a strip, and then they take this out, and then specialists come in to take all these hairs out of that scalp and holding the follicle, and then they transplant them in the areas where you need them on the scalp or on the eyebrow. Now, after about three months, those fall out, but the underlying follicle starts to grow again. And, uh, and that's been very successful for a lot of people. That's certainly something I would recommend for a lot of people especially people who don't intend to go through the challenge that I've raised about changing the energy levels and overcompensating in other areas of your life that are out of balance and undercompensating. Uh, and it, it works. I mean, and in fact, you're having your own hair transplanted from the back of your head, where you have the most, to the top and front, where you have the least. So that's not bad. It can cost anywhere from five to $10,000. Then you can have weaves and wigs, all right. Um, and from its earliest use in the 1970s, an oral uh, antihypertensive drug, minoxidil, uh, was found to have serious side effects, including that one fifth of all people taking it later developed a condition in which hair grows excessively on the body. And uh, so they supposedly have corrected that and uh, for androgenic hair loss and it can be taken orally. Again, I'm merely giving you some of this, um, and you can have all forms of 
adverse hair reaction, uh, body reactions to some of this medication, including skin rashes, irritation, discomfort, itching, and burning, scaly scalp, excess hair growth in patches all over the body, and even hair loss. And uh, it also, minoxidil can shorten the resting phase of the hair growth cycle, thus resulting in significant hair fall. And it also can cause significant hair shedding once you stop taking it. So I'm not in favor of those, but again, I believe you have freedom of choice, so you should be able to take what you want. But that's the orthodox approach. Now for the natural approach. When the hair is in the growth phase, it needs a full spectrum of nutrition to become the healthiest it can be. Nutrition status has been found to play an important role in all types of hair loss. Some of the nutrients required for healthy hair growth can be gleaned from a really healthy organic diet full of organic fruits and vegetables, whole grains, legumes, pulses, tubers, root vegetables, nuts and seeds, and the nut butters, fermented foods are all a part of that, and healthy juicing. Now, I'm going to give you some specific nutrients that I consider the superstars to balance your body biochemistry and uh, to support hair growth and prevent hair loss. And the diet should be vegan, non-GMO, and derived from organic food ingredients where possible. And they should contain no nanoparticles, which are ubiquitous in food production these days, as nanoparticles can bypass membranes and behave differently in the body than the same substance in a large particle size. Metabolic nanoparticles of silicon dioxide and titanium dioxide have been found to cause digestive problems. And because malabsorption can contribute to hair loss, it's important to check that any supplement manufacturer has a policy banning the use of those nanoparticles. So let's take down some notes now. Vitamin A. Though adequate amounts of vitamin A are needed for healthy vision, immune function, and cellular growth, taking too much has been observed in, to result in hair loss. It's recommended not to take more than 10,000 international units daily. And better still, you would work out the ideal amount for your needs with a guided health professional. Get with someone to help counsel you with this, someone who has background in nutritional biochemistry and physiology. The B-complex, you really can't uh, say enough good about this. Thiamine B1, riboflavin B2, niacin B3, pentothenic acid B5, B, vitamin B6, biotin B7, folate up to one gram milligram per day, that's a thousand micrograms, and B12 about a thousand micrograms, all aid in cell metabolism. And deficiencies, especially of vitamin B2, riboflavin, biotin, folate, and B12 have been associated with hair loss and folate with premature whitening. And uh, 30 micrograms of biotin is recommended. And this is thought to be adequately providing for a normal diet uh, for uh, our hair health. Now, biotin, B-I-O-T-I-N, is, is particular in this sense. It's received a lot of attention for its promise of increased hair growth. Biotin deficiency is thought to be rare, and adequate amounts are thought to be produced in the intestines, but a deficiency can be acquired or inherited. The amount of biotin provided in a normal diet is thought to be adequate to prevent deficiency. However, supplementation has a low risk of toxicity because it comes in very small amounts. It's a micronutrient, not a macronutrient. And supplementing with biotin may pose a problem if a medical practitioner orders you uh, a biotin uh, type of technology test uh, just to see if the, the biotin is immunoassay positive or negative. If this happens, you should inform that person that you're taking biotin supplements and ask whether to discontinue those supplements prior to a test. All right. Biotin deficiency can also be acquired uh, if you eat raw eggs, if you take antibiotics, if you take anti epileptic medications such as valpric uh, acid, uh, or if you are used treatments for bipolar disorder and migraines, 
or an acne medication, Accutane, or have a problem with malabsorption or alcoholism or even pregnancy. Now, superstar is vitamin B12. If necessary, you'll know what that is from DNA synthesis and neurological function and red blood cell formation and methyl uh, cobalamin and uh, five, uh, five dehoxide uh, use. These are all useful for hair growth. 2.4 micrograms is recommended daily for an adult. And I happen to think that that is too little. So I would go to a, at least 500 micrograms per day of B12. And its potential for toxicity is very low. So you're not going to have a problem with that. But B12 can be helpful to help prevent premature whitening and graying in childhood or early adulthood. One of the most important nutrients you can take into your body for hair is biotin, B-I-O-T-I-N. It's received a lot of attention for its promise in increasing hair growth. Biotin deficiency is thought to be rare and adequate amounts are thought to be produced in the intestine, but a deficiency that can happen uh, can occur, and uh, especially if you're taking other medications. So check your blood to see which nutrients you're adequate in, high in, or low in. The amount of biotin provided in a normal diet is generally adequate to prevent deficiency. However, supplementation has a low risk of toxicity, and supplementing with biotin may pose a problem if a medical practitioner orders uh, you to have a biotin uh, lat technology test. But that's something that's not that often. But normal biotin intake is fine unless you're taking antibiotics, anti-epileptic medication, uh, like valproic acid, uh, which is used to treat bipolar, migraines, acne medic medication like Accutane, where you have a problem with the malabsorption or alcoholism or even pregnant. That's why it's so easy to get a test. Now, the vitamin B12 is really necessary for DNA synthesis and neurological function and red blood cell formation. And the methyl cobalamin, uh, vitamin B12, is really good for hair growth. Now, I recommend you have about 500 micrograms a day. You don't need a whole lot more than that unless you have a condition that is specific to that. But B12 helps prevent premature whitening and uh, whitening and graying in childhood or early adulthood. Now, superstars vitamin C. Ascorbic acid is a potent antioxidant that works against free radical damage. It's also essential for the body to create collagen, along with lysine and proline. And vitamin C is also integral to proper iron absorption. Citrus fruits, potatoes, tomatoes, green peppers, um, and cabbage are all particularly good in vitamin C when you can supplement one, 2,000 milligrams a day, spread throughout a day. Vitamin D, even low levels of vitamin D supplements have been found to improve symptoms of telogen and androgenic alopecia in their phases. Vitamin D deficiency is one of the factors contributing to alopecia, hair loss. Vitamin D has also been found to help with premature graying of the hair. And spending time in the sun is an obvious way to increase vitamin D levels, but one should be conscious due to the extreme heat of recent summers. And uh, always take your vitamin C and E uh, before you go in the sun and after you come out of the sun can help prevent some of the sun exposure that can lead to burning and hence skin cancer. Don't be overexposed to the sun, but don't be underexposed either. And uh, that's very important. Now, vitamin E is important. It's an essential um, nutrient, but take vitamin E with the mixed tocopherols and tocotrienols together. Like I would say 100 milligrams of mixed uh, tocotrienols and about 400 units of vitamin E itself. And what we found is that it can increase hair numbers compared to placebo in a 2010 study. Iron deficiency can contribute to hair loss but it's not necessarily wise to supplement unless there is a deficiency. It's more common in females, and iron deficiency can contribute to androgenic alopecia or 
telogen uh, if you live in or the speeding up the process. This can be balanced by eating iron-rich foods like kale, very important. Make sure you're taking vitamin C, but don't be taking lots of iron because that is not good. But it, iron can help prevent premature whitening. Selenium, essential micronutrient, and it helps to synthesize protein. It's been observed that women with ovarian cancer who elected to take chemotherapy cancer treatment experienced less hair loss when supplementing with selenium. 55 micrograms was recommended. I recommend 200 micrograms, but don't take more than 300 because it can lead to toxicity and hair loss. Selenium also appears to play a role in preventing premature whitening and graying of the hair in childhood and early adolescence. The branched-chain amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, uh, isoleucine, and valine, V-A-L-I-N-E, they play a key role in protein synthesis and building muscles. And the branched-chain amino acids are generally derived from, uh, from hair. And while vegan versions can be deprived from corn, but it's, it does help. There's not a lot of study on it. Copper, no more than one milligram a day. Pycnogenol, P-Y-C-N-O-G-E-N-O-L, derived from French maritime pine bark. Pycnogenol taken three times a day at 50 milligram doses improved hair density by 23% after six months. And that's important. And this was in Han's Chinese menopausal women in 2023 double-blind placebo-controlled trial. You also have capsaicin, C-A-P-S-A-I-C-I-N, and isoflavones. Oral capsaicin at six milligrams a day, which should be derived from organic hot peppers. You can get capsules of them, one capsule. And isoflavones, 75 milligrams a day, which should be derived from organic non-GMO soy, were found to increase hair regrowth in the majority of volunteers with hair loss in a 2007 study. Ginger has been observed to improve the oxygenation of the, of the antigen uh, phase and be, be balancing and helps people with alopecia to restore normal levels of zinc in the blood. Turmeric, T-U-R-M-E-R-I-C, uh, curcumin uh, has been found to improve skin conditions, including alopecia, whether taken internally or applied topically. Uh, but by the way, if it's applied topically, do not touch this fiber yellow powder to anything you don't want stained. And you also have to rebalance your gut microbiota. Hair loss may be associated with the, the digestive problems, inflammatory bowel disease, and gut uh, dysbiosis. A case report of an 86-year-old man who suffered from gut dysbiosis recovered from alopecia and chronic diarrhea simultaneously on receiving six rounds of a, a very powerful uh, probiotic. So in other words, every day let's try to get some good probiotics into our system. And then many of today's styling methods used most frequently by women result in very rough treatment of your hair. If you aim to regrow your hair as much as possible, dyeing, drying, heavy brushing or combing, especially when the hair is wet, uh, or other chemical treatments, hot irons, or hair blowing, um, well, I would avoid all of them. Braiding long hair or styling it um, in other gentle, natural styles can serve to protect it from breakage and damage when you don't want to wear, uh, want to, to have hair loss. Hair should be protected as much as possible from the harsh elements. And that's why when I'm out, I wear simple baseball cap protected from the sun to win the cold. And in all natural shampoos and all natural conditions are best in order to avoid chemical exposure. And when shampooing the hair, hair should be taken to wash the shampoo out thoroughly, as well as to not rub the hair too hard when drying. I don't dry my hair. I just take my hands, run it through, and let it dry naturally. Rather, massage these products gently into your scalp. Look at what you put into your hair and the way you would look at what you put into your body is key. Organic is best. Artificial and chemical additives are best avoided. Hair oils can be used as pre-wash conditioners. 
These are thought to protect the cubicles of the hair and make it shiny and smooth. However, different hair types react differently to different types of oil, and too much oil can have adverse effects. A small amount, very small amount. So if you were just to take some olive oil and the bottle and put it against your skin and pull it back just that little bit, and you rub it and massage it in. Coconut oil is recommended. Extra virgin organic olive oil is recommended. And if you're rinsing oil out of the hair, be mindful that drainage pipes can become clogged over time. But it's good if you put a screen there and then every time you shower, just take your foot and see if any hair is coming out. Also, some topical ingredients which studies have found to be useful in regrowing hair include pumpkin seed oil, onion juice, and watercress extract, and garlic gel. And also, uh, apple proanthocyanidin, B12, these are all good. And finally, it is my experience that acupuncture done correctly on LR3 points and GB20 points can make a difference. And also ST36, which is below the knee. Of the points near the top of the forehead, a BL3 can be stimulated as well. And you can press these same points with your fingers using acupressure techniques. And acupuncture can also be given uh, in tandem with herbal medicines by experienced and trustworthy medical practitioners, especially if medical doctors who study and master traditional Chinese medicine. I have preventative acupuncture, and he puts one right in the head, and he keeps saying, Carrie, your hair is just growing phenomenally. It's thick, it's lustful, healthy. Yeah, I don't blow it out. It's what it is. And uh, so you can help with acupuncture. Also, mind-body technique. Uh, though few clinical trials appear to have been done on these mind-body techniques as a first-line treatment for hair loss, I think they should be done in tandem. Meditation, mindful meditation is important. Reducing stress is very important. And uh, there's a whole area called psychodermatology, and it's uh, especially, it's examining the connection between the states of the skin and that of the psyche. Hypnotherapy has been found to improve hair regrowth and ease anxiety in case reports. And mindful meditation, stress reduction has been found to improve one's state of mind and sense of well-being when dealing with a stressful condition like hair loss. So great care should be taken in researching and selecting a hypnotherapist. If you ever choose to see one, hypnotherapy involves going into an altered state of consciousness where one is much more impressionable and hypnotic suggestion can be deeply influential in a constructive way. But choose your people based upon that. And then light therapy. There's a, what is called a photobiomodulation or low-level laser therapy. It uses red light lasers to stimulate hair growth. And it works. I definitely recommend it. And for generally, you are under the, put this, looks like a little tap. I absolutely agree that photobiomodulation or low-level laser therapy uses red light th lasers to stimulate hair growth. They use it every day or every other day. And different devices exist on the market, including caps or helmets or handheld combs or brushes or stationary hoods you wear for a period of time, generally 10 to 20 minutes. But it has to be done over a period of months to see results, generally six months or longer. But I've seen a lot of people who are doing it and they're getting great results. A 2020 systematic review found that the use of this therapy is effective in the treatment of male and female pattern hair loss. Though these results should be interpreted cautiously because some of the studies included uh, not always using just the device. So use these as you see fit, but they're non-toxic and they're good. And so those are my protocols. Those are the ways I have found. Now, is this gonna work on everyone? No because you have to see what part of your life is out of balance. And whatever part of your life is out of balance, that's where you might be hitting a wall. That's why I say, look at every single part of your life and say, what do I need to rebalance? And the energy, the energy you bring into your life, 
that can make all the difference in the world. Positive energy, healing energy, uh, having the right diet, the juices, flooding the body with healing nutrients, but then having proper blood chemistries done so that you're aware you're not exceeding what is good and you're not diminished in what you need. Get that nice balance. That's it. I'd like to hear from you if you start this protocol and over a period of months see differences. Send me pictures. Take a picture now and then take a picture when you feel you've got results. I'd like to hear what changed in your life. Thank you for watching. Please share this with others if you find it of value. I'll have more classrooms on the air every day. And go to go to the site and see how many thousands of different types of uh, classrooms I've shared with you up to this point. Have a nice day, everyone. Thank you for watching.